Well, it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the fall series of On the Pulse. I am Chris Fortman, CEO at the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation, and I am really thrilled about our topic today, which is all about social justice and health equity. Like many organizations, equity and inclusion is a core value, and especially for the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation around health equity and social justice. Um, with that in mind, I just would like the group to understand in our strategic plan and strategic priorities, we state very clearly, and I'll just quote it, that advancing health and equity through research, education, and organizational practices is a strategic priority for MHIF. Um, I'm proud to say that over the last couple of years, we've really focused in on bringing together our board of directors and our staff and leadership around work groups focusing on key areas such as what is our hiring process, what is our cultural awareness, and how do we celebrate the uniqueness of our staff? That is a key priority for MHIF. Another priority is what is the inclusion in clinical trials and other research so that we are really representing women and other minorities um, fairly and appropriately in our clinical trials. And then finally, education and community partnership is so critical. Really working with and learning from trusted community partners who can help us move the needle around understanding in cardiovascular health, improve trust, and um, understand the importance of heart health overall. So we couldn't be more lucky than having Dr. Courtney Jordan Beckler, who serves as the Medical Director of Health Equity and Health Promotion at the Foundation. And today she is going to moderate a panel of experts to talk about health equity and social justice. And so let me tell you a little more about Dr. Beckler. Uh, she serves as, again, as I mentioned, as Medical Director of Health Equity and Health Promotion for MHIF. She is also a general cardiologist at the Minneapolis Heart Institute who is passionate about a healthy state of well-being, body, mind, and spirit, and is a national leader in integrative medicine and wellness. Dr. Jordan Beckler previously served as, an, as the Assistant Commissioner for Health Improvement for the state of Minnesota and also helped grow and lead the Penny George Institute for Health and Healing at Alina Health. Courtney is truly a community leader and a leader at the foundation, and so it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Courtney Jordan Beckler. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, Chris. Really excited for this important topic today, setting the standard for health justice. I'm going to take just a moment to bring us high level um, about this topic. And first and foremost, I always think it's important for people to understand why this matters to me personally. Um, it always happens. It always helps to have a why. This is my family here. You can see my mom and dad on the left side of the screen. I was adopted, and my father is black. Um, my mother is white, and my brother and sister and I on the right side here. Uh, all three of us adopted, um, coming from various backgrounds, and now we've got these lovely grandkids that are much older than this. But it's important to me because here is my dad and my son together, and despite the fact that we grew up um, in similar uh, similar locations in Minneapolis here, they have very different trajectories based on the color of their skin, which is why we're talking about this. And consistent with our mission here at the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation, where we're talking about how we best create a world without heart and vascular disease for all. So again, we're not going to focus a huge amount on these facts and figures, but here's what we know. Blacks have the highest rates of heart disease in the country. They're two to three times more likely to die from heart disease. While we have seen cardio more, excuse me, cardiovascular mortality rates declining for everybody, we see that slope, that decline less for our black population than compared to our white population. So what happens when you have established heart disease? We know if you're on Medicare and you're black, you're 42% less likely to get a defibrillator after having a heart attack. 
And when we look at that a little bit closer, as it relates to presenting with chest pain, if you're a woman and you're black, you're less likely to get a cardiac catheterization um, when you present to the emergency room with chest pain than our white population. So at every level of this, we've got work to do. Um, we know when we look a little bit at our imaging and at our tests that diagnose these things, we also know that women, black women, and older black women are the least likely to receive diagnostic heart tests. Um, this was looked at over a 12-year period. So again, we've got work to do at every step of the way. When we look back at history, we know there's a precedence for this, unfortunately. Health disparities between our black and white population have existed since the earliest first settlers of our country. Um, many of us know about the Tuskegee syphilis trials that were not long ago, where we know that unfortunately treatment that existed was withheld from our black population. As early as the 1990s, there was uh, prestigious universities showing that there was, quote, a genetic etiology of aggressive behavior. That study was actually done by withholding medications and sleep depriving young black boys. The Institute of Medicine put out a, a white paper in 2002 showing that there was unequal treatment and disparities in healthcare delivery, specifically that cardiac meds and cabbage were um, given disproportionately at lower rates to our black population. And in 2004, we had a systemic review looking at angiograms, angioplasty, bypass surgery, and lytics, those drugs that break up the clots. 21 out of 23 of those studies showed that African Americans were less likely to get bypass surgery. So let's just look real quickly at what is race. Um, as you can see here, this is a diet, or this is a description, a definition from 1996. Pure race in the sense of genetically homogeneous populations do not exist in the human species today, nor is there any evidence that they've ever existed in the past. Biological differences between human beings reflect both hereditary factors and the influence of natural and social environments. In most cases, these differences are due to the interaction of both. So I would just emphasize for all of our viewers today, there's no scientific basis for race. We have defined this by the Human Genome Project that shows we are 99% the same. This is truly a social construct that needs to be undone. Uh, Circulation put out a statement in 2021 emphasizing why the focus on cardiovascular health in persons of Af African descent is justified based on these persistent disparities in morbidity and mortality from cardiovascular disease that are experienced by our black population, our black adults and children in the United States. And the emphasis here was also that we saw these same disparities um, come through in the pandemic, that there were preventable deaths that unfortunately disproportionately impacted our black population. So looking at Minnesota, uh, we are pleased to say we've had the best cardiovascular mortality rate since 1999. However, that's not the same when we look um, at things a little bit more closely. So we have some of the largest disparities in the country for our African American and our American Indian population. You can see here that this happens starting um, in the 30s and really doesn't levelize into the 80s. And again, just breaking that down a little bit further, those up to twofold uh, more likely to experience uh, cardiovascular death. Part of that is based on um, work that shows that where you live matters. So here you can see in Medina, Minnesota, where the average life expectancy is about 92 versus what we see in the Minneapolis Elliott area, Elliott Park area, just blocks from Abbott Northwestern, where the average population um, life expectancy is 67.2. And then in the Rondo neighborhood, a uh, historically black neighborhood in St. Paul, where the average life expectancy is the lowest at 64.8. So we need to think about how and where this comes from. Um, many of you have likely heard of the social determinants of health, which is a huge piece of things. 80% um, of our health outcomes are there. 20% being the genetics and clinical care. But how do we start to blur those lines and have more impact? Um, we're pleased to have partnered with iHeal um, Insight News, founded iHeal Insight News is a local newspaper here in Minneapolis, a historically black newspaper founded by Al McFarland. 
His daughter, Batala McFarlane, is one of our panelists today, and we have been super thankful for a great partnership um, where iHeal was created, the Insight Health Equity Lab. Emphasis here being um, Insight News is a trusted resource to the community, to the Black population here in town, have been communicating for over four decades on important topics, including health. So when we think about how we better partner with folks who have trust in the community, Insight is a huge pop, a piece of that uh, puzzle. So as I mentioned, we really want to look at breaking down the social determinants of health and the role that the Heart Institute Foundation and the Minneapolis Heart Institute can play in that. You can see how we've done that here, and we will highlight some of this. We have a podcast series that we've been specifically working to change who we're educating, how we're educating. You'll hear about that. Um, as it relates to that healthcare arm, we've partnered with local community clinics, um, with Southside Community Clinic, as well as North Point Health and Wellness. We've been doing health screenings out actually where people are, um, often outside of our clinical settings, as well as health promotion. Um, we've also tried to change the social and community context. Again, um, partnerships with Kappa Psi Fraternity nationally, a uh, black fraternity, as well as helping let the community design what our trials look like and, and who is a part of these trials. And then finally, we know that economic stability is a huge piece of that. How we promote local community-owned businesses, such as Insight News, is one of those very mechanisms. This is a picture from the Kappa Psi fraternity. We had the great opportunity to partner with them um, in an event in May of this year. We just finished one this last weekend in Baton Rouge, um, Louisiana. But this is a great opportunity where Edwards Life Science, um, they do work with one of our renowned cardiologists here, Dr. Mario Gessel, uh, because we see big disparities on who gets transaortic valve replacements. 97% of those people are white, um, despite the fact that we know aortic stenosis doesn't, um, doesn't decide based on the color of your skin. So this has been a great opportunity to partner with national organizations like Kappa Psi, a black fraternity that has the ears of many black people, men in this case, though we've had lots of women at these events as well, both nationally and internationally. I mentioned our podcast. Uh, so again, Insight News, uh, their founder, Al McFarland, this is his daughter, Patala McFarland, who's also one of our panelists. Um, we have started Heart to Heart Minneapolis. The goal here is really to change the voice um, and hear firsthand from only uh, Black interviewees about their quest with preventing, treating, and um, finding out about heart disease. So we've had folks from prevention, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, all the way to valve disease, um, uh, everything that you can think of, even aortic ruptures. And so we are thrilled that Boston Scientific was a partner with this, with us and was willing to be patient and to listen to what we heard the community wanted was uh, to be able to hear directly from people of color who've experienced heart disease. We've written four articles that have been in the Pioneer Press. Um, I would encourage you guys all to take a look at them um, and hear some of the messages we're trying to get out. Our first one, um, Minnesota has huge disparities in our heart health and how we aim to do our part to fix that. This was written by uh, myself, Dr. Mosey Bennett, and Dr. Julian Christopher, also one of our panelists today, um, talking about much of what we're talking about today and how we can do a different different work going forward. We also had Batala McFarlane um, writing about the people are the solution, not the problem, and really writing from that community perspective. Chance York, who's running one of our studies here, your here and now is worth your attention, whoever, you're, whoever you are. And then finally, um, Chance and I wrote yoga and meditation study, heart for communities impacted um, most by heart disparities. And here, again, we are just thrilled to be delivering what we heard loud and clear in addition to um, medical procedures and devices 
what we heard largely from our communities most impacted by heart disparities was how can we do more to prevent this from ever happening and how can we be a part of it? So really thrilled um, to have that opportunity with Chance York leading a study on the role of meditation and yoga in um, black individuals 18 and over nationally. Um, here's an image of some of the screenings we're doing. So we've partnered with the YMCA, and we have our summer interns here from the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation um, doing blood pressure screenings at the Harold Mazel YMCA in North Minneapolis. Um, had a great opportunity to talk about the barriers and, again, most importantly, to get outside of our own walls and be um, a part of enhancing trust. So what did we hear here? We heard over and over, um, trust is, continues to be a huge issue. Um, we heard that we want to co-create, so please listen to us in your journey. Um, this is an opportunity for medicine, healthcare systems to stand alongside of rather, rather than simply leading. Um, absolutely a critical need to acknowledge the past. And while many of us um, perhaps did not directly contribute to that past, I think it's critical that we acknowledge the wrongings that many health systems had um, in, in this trauma from the past. Again, as I mentioned, leading alongside the community is critical. Access, access, access. So where we do this, how we enroll people in studies, um, where we, how we make it easy for people to receive care where they live, where they work, in areas that they trust is going to be a huge part of changing things going forward and really helping to create a movement. People want to see this change. Um, I think folks are really sick of hearing about the statistics, which is why so much of this is emphasized on how we create positive movement going forward. And then who else do we need to be partnering with? We recognize that the health system is only one piece of the um, needed change, but there's the opportunity to partner with others that are doing great work like um, Insight News. So this was an article that was just put out in um, JAC, the Journal of the American College of Cardiology in July of 2022, talking about looking at cultural competence and humility in cardiovascular clinical trials. So for any of you that are on this webinar that don't know, Jack is sort of our Bible within um, cardiology. And you can see here what they talk about as being key components, trainings in cultural competence and humility, having diverse research teams, tailored communi communication tools for patients. Um, so again, avoiding exclusion criteria based on lang language or socioeconomic status, um, tailoring things to meet the cultural needs, community-based engagement, so how we engage with these communities in design, execution, and dissemination, and then really looking at who and how we fund. Um, again, I put these together so you can see how we are doing exactly that, and that's a big part of what you're going to hear from our panel. So we have the great, I have the great opportunity, you have the great opportunity to listen, but I had the chance to interview our partners in this work. I mentioned Batala McFarland um, works with Insight News with her dad, Al, who started the, found, the paper and has now, she has started iHeal um, and is also my co-podcast host. Uh, Dr. Julene Christopher, serves on our board here at the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation. She's also a cognitive behavioral scientist researcher, um, has done lots of work in the health equity space. And then finally, Ms. Delane Thibault Thomas, our first ever health, women's health equity fellow here at the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation, is doing absolutely incredible groundbreaking work and thrilled to have her as a part of our team. So with that, we're gonna start in on our panel. Good afternoon, everyone. I am thrilled to have a panel of experts to speak more about the work we're doing in health justice. So I'm gonna get right into it because really our goal here is to get to the meat of the matter of what's working, what's not working, and why you all are dear friends and colleagues and peers in achieving the goals we have 
I'm going to start with you, Fatala McFarlane. Um, my question for you is um, for you to tell us a little bit about how you first got involved in the work of equity in heart health disparities and why you feel from a newspaper perspective it's so critical that you're a part of this work. Uh, thank you, Courtney, and uh, thank you for putting this panel together. Our newspaper, we have always believed that uh, our community, we hold the solutions, and that stories from our community should promote folks as um, those who provide the solution and not the problem. Too often we hear about people in community from a lens of um, despair, of poor health, of crime, but we know that we are more than that. And so about 20 to 30 years ago, we partnered with Health Partners um, to start printing informa information that uh, was culturally specific. That was, that was the term at the time. Um, culturally specific health information designed to inspire our readers to make informed choices on how to live healthier lifestyles. Um, from there, we... Uh, launched a fitness challenge, 10 weeks of uh, fitness, yoga, nutrition coaching, and lifestyle coaching. Hugely successful, so much so that when we decided that we need to take a break from that program, like participants were angry. So it just showed us that people um, needed something in community that was easily accessible, led by people who looked like them, and that they felt the results. They were empowered. Um, and then breaks again, and that led us to our connection. Mm -hmm. How can we use our, um, our role as the storytellers to just um, connect with people in the policy spaces, in the research spaces, um, to, to do more of this work, to to create a space where more people can come to the table, we can create the table, and again, be part of the solution. And also, it's personal. My father is um, living with heart disease. It's well-managed. He also has a prostate cancer, which is well-managed. And I have a health journey as well. And so if we can share our stories, our concerns, our successes, um, I think that's just one way that we can deepen that connection to people in community. Absolutely, that's super helpful. One just quick follow-up to that before I get on to our other panelists. Um, curious, uh, one thing that's become very trendy in the field of research and dissemination of health equity is communication and um, doing more around study of health messaging that matters um, within communities that see the largest disparities. So being that you've been in this business for over four decades, I'm just curious um, how you're seeing your role in that and if you're seeing people reach out to you in that way. Yeah, we've been doing this, right? Um, and we're proud to say that, that we believe that we are one of the first uh, ethnic publications that really started focusing on health, uh, the stories, again, from us, about us. But yeah, and I'm glad you used that word trendy, because it does seem like that that's the new sexy thing. But the question is, um, how are you connecting with media agencies from community? Are you taking whichever um, uh, funding you may have and going to a larger publication? You know, one hand of me, I believe that information is so important no matter where it's housed. So I, I, I acknowledge that, right? But I must say that we are just not media agencies. We are trusted advisors in the community. We have those connections those relationships with people who are most harmed by these disparities, the things that folks are talking about. And so while the goal is to have as many informed people as possible so we can move the needle, um, we must uplift our stories. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We're going to move on to you, Ms. Delane Thibault Thomas. Um, I want to ask you specifically, given your background in public health, about the intersectionality between public health and clinical medicine and why, given that you have chosen to pursue our first ever Women's Health Equity Fellow. I have always really appreciated where public health and uh, clinical care combine to do the 
the most impact in the, the best for community. So um, this started actually when I was a child, I wanted to be a physician and, and um, my whole uh, journey through education, I was in pursuit of that. And the more I learned about public health, the more I learned that you know there are strategies and interventions that we can put in place to reach the greatest amount of people. Um, and so the further I got into public health, the more I learned about health equity and all of the disparities that exist in our communities and in our society. And so the way that I like to see myself now is as a health justice warrior. Um, health equity is the place we're trying to get to and we use clinical practice like physicians and, and other providers and we use interventions from public health to, um, to solve some of these disparities. But what we're not doing a great job of is naming why the disparities exist in the first place and, um, and practicing justice as a mechanism for achieving health equity in the future. So what I would like to see um, is clinical practice moving outside of the four walls of institutions and into community because that's a just way of practicing. And I would like to see um, public health embracing clinical practice as well, uh, making sure that we're incorporating sound um, research and, and, and clinical ways of doing things into our practices. That's how we reach the, the greatest amount of people. Agreed, well, well said. Um, Dr. Christopher, as an influential board member um, in various sectors, but as one of our board members here at the Heart Institute Foundation, what makes you most frustrated about this work? I would say that for every member of the community, regardless of which silo, which racial group, which economic status we sit in, we have the opportunity to be able to dip in and out. And then there are others who are actually participating in this work on a daily basis that then it becomes so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who have the opportunity to be able to dip in and out and decide when certain aspects of this work might be important, Unfortunately, it, it leaves a mismatch in terms of energy expended. Oh. So that then becomes very, very frustrating from the perspective of those who are entrenched in, in you know, not just the community, but also just in the valley, if you will, doing this work, expending the energy, having the opportunity to be able to um, have some of that shared, if you will. That's, that's one of the things I would say is, is just, it, it's, it's tiring, it's, it's a little bit depressing sometimes. So that would be my input in terms of the negative, and then we'll move over to the positive. I'm like, drop, yeah, what, what she said. <laughs> um, no, but you, you, you are right. And um, my uh, follow-up comment, to that, it's this expectation that the problem will be solved in six months. And if we don't see the numbers that we think we should see from over there, then nope. It was a failure. It was a failure. Sorry, we're not returning. And, you know, something else that's, you know, becoming kind of maybe cliche by now, but what are folks saying? It took how many years to create these problems? Mm -hmm. We're not gonna fix them overnight maybe not even in a generation. And I mean, you two have definitely said it all. I think one last point that I can um, add, it's frustrating that something like the murder of George Floyd has to be the catalyst for many organizations to put out statements, podcasts, think pieces around health equity. And it's been two years and some change, and already some of the energy is waning. Mm -hmm. Some of the, um, the, the expediency and urgency around this issue is already waning um, for some people. 
But for others of us who are inside of this reality, walking through this world as minoritized or, or marginalized people, those of us who are first generation Americans or black or women or queer people don't get the option to move on. Um, and so when you're living in this experience as a person of color and a woman and a first generation American, trying to do the work of convincing people that your life matters enough to center Center Insight News when you think about funding. Center Batala's work when you think about who to connect with. You know, you're trying to do this work while also surviving the impact of having to do the work. That's a, a frustrating thing. Absolutely. So what leaves you most optimistic for the future? <laughs> okay, so I will start again. Um, I, I will say the opportunity to have met all of you fine women um, as a result, I mean, Dr. Beckler and I have been friends for a while, and I was afforded the opportunity of meeting Batala and, and Delane and many others along the way. And, and I feel like one of the things that is um, most inspiring is the opportunity not only to interact with and engage with people who are very different thinkers, but to be able to get energy from it that... Uh, uh, chance meeting or the opportunity that, you know, multiple meetings and, and time and space that we're spending together. Because uh, I think more importantly is we're here now. We represent our uh, generation in this space, in time. And so therefore, I have to believe that there are other people who are also having the same types of conversations. And we then will be able to act as sentinels. And then others can then take up the work and push forward. So, you know, with, with that, I'll, I'll say what does give me energy and inspire me is, is really this opportunity to sit here and, and have this conversation, truly. Um, I'm really excited uh, and inspired by community voice. Um, the opportunity to hear community members speak back to us and let us know, hey, we still have a trust issue. That's important to hear. Um, I'm excited about the bi-directional education and, and, and um, partnership that's happening between this kind of work and the community members like Insight News. Um, community is speaking. They're showing up to events. They're telling us they're excited about things um, that we have going on, different initiatives. And that's, that is energizing, um, that we're not just turning our wheels. They're ready as well. So. It's definitely the connections, the connections with, you know, with you all, but also too, um, like talking about, you know, have doing the work for so many years. Um, when you think people aren't paying attention, and somebody's like, I read that article about this issue, or I listened to your podcast, and thank you. You, you know, um, I'm your dad is AFib, so am I, and I'm just fifty. All right, well, you want to come share your story? Uh, yeah. I think I will, because I haven't really talked about it too much, but I, I think I will. So you, when you hear from community mm -hmm. and um, that you know that you are changing minds, that you are inspiring people, um, it's very uplifting. Um, it's a reminder that, you know, yep, you can take a small break, but also you must stay committed to the work. So um, let's go. Let's, okay. let's keep doing it. Our last and final question is just if you guys could wave your magic wand and see one particular thing happen um, to our listeners out there, anything that you would, that you're thinking, gosh, I just wish someone would fund this, or I just wish this would happen, whatever that might be, anything that you've been thinking about, dreaming about? You know, so we're, um, these conversations, so we've got, um, morning shows, right, that are focused on just current issues, a couple national health shows, but what if there was a show that's focus was health justice, that centered women, um, black and brown women, queer folks, folks who are often, as you said, Delaine, marginalized. I think that would be huge. 
and exciting. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're putting that out there. Putting it out there. That's right. Yes. Thank you. I love it. So I'm reading a lot of journals that have health equity as a key term in them, but don't mention racism. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing, you know, journal articles that have health equity in the title, but don't um, mention resource denial Mm -hmm. in low income communities and the injustices that are occurring and have historically occurred that lead to the disparities. So I would like to get more specific about language. Mm -hmm. When we talk about equity, what we're really talking about is injustice. Mm -hmm. And if you're a provider that cares about health equity, then I would hope that you're a provider that cares about racism, because it's not race that's, that's causing these disparities, it's racism. So in order to effectively speak to and walk into health equity, you have to be specific about what you're actually solving for. Absolutely. And I would add to that, as I think about the clinical community, I think about physicians, they have such a very, very important work. And as they're sitting in the space with the patient, I would love to see where there is opportunity carved out for them to recognize that these marginalized groups, these people of color, there are so many inputs into why they are sitting here in this space with mistrust, with uh, all of these numbers in terms of disparities. It's, it's, it's a holistic problem and it requires a holistic solution. I would love to see where the office, in terms of where uh, the, the clinical practice is, that they make it a point to make sure that they are acknowledging to these marginalized groups, to these people of color, that we recognize that this is a holistic issue, that you are coming here in this space, you are trusting us with your care, and we recognize that not for everyone that is the same uh, outcome. And more importantly, I would also love to see in terms of our community members that they are able to harness the tools to help empower them to just push forward and to be able to get the kind of care that they deserve and get the kind of care that is appropriate for them so that we can truly start to see more meaningful outcomes. That's beautiful, ladies. I cannot thank you enough for you. being a part of this discussion. Um, again, my goal here was to get to the meat and the heart, um, especially as a vegetarian. Um, <laughs> I think it was great. I loved it. So um, thank, thank you. you. Oh, yeah, thank you, thank you for yeah. being partners, friends, um, and everything else. All right. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, We do have time for some questions with Dr. Courtney Jordan-Beckler. Dr. Jordan-Beckler, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to not only uh, sit down, uh, record a presentation, as well as the amazing panel discussion, but for taking out uh, time out of your day today, as I know you are seeing patients. Um, So to quickly introduce myself, folks, my name is John Rickert, and I'm the virtual event lead here at the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation. Again, on behalf of MHIF, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, So the way that you ask questions via Zoom, and I can see that there's a few coming through the Q&A pod. We also have some that came through uh, from registration, but you drag your cursor across your Zoom screen, uh, access that toolbar, and click on the Q&A pod uh, to submit a question. And you may submit questions anonymously if you'd like. So Dr. Jordan Beckler, um, the first question that we have that came through from registration is if you could equip attendees with one key takeaway from today, what would that be? I think um, what I would say, well, first of all, hello, welcome to everybody. Glad to be here uh, virtually and from the clinical side of things. But uh, what I would say is I would emphasize that going forward, we have to do it differently. We have to acknowledge the past and that this takes time. I think as you heard from the panel, it's really critical that we. this is not a quick fix. It's not a quick calcium score or some type of screening test and then call it quits. Um, we've got decades and centuries to, to, to quickly um, close these gaps. 
uh, I mean, I remain very optimistic for the future, but um, but my point would be we it is the definition of insanity, right? To keep continuing to do the same things that we are doing and expect change. Um, so it's time for a fresh approach. And I hope you heard how we're doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, so a follow-up question is where is MHIF going to focus next or specifically where are you planning on focusing next? Yeah, I think, and you probably heard a lot of this, but we're really trying to focus on um, bringing opportunities, access, service outside of the traditional community setting, or excuse me, outside of the traditional clinic setting to the community to where it's um, easier to access healthcare, easier to access education, um, easier to listen bi-directionally to communities, and, and most importantly, to um, improve trust to actually show up and to continue to show up. So I think you can expect to see more of us um, outside in the YMCA, in the schools, um, in, in places that belong connected to healthcare. Absolutely. So I did see a question that came through from Melissa that sort of has something to do with kind of what we were just talking about. Um, but do you think there are additional areas that MHIF could focus on uh, to include youth in the community for the prevention of heart disease and in turn health disparities? Yeah, thanks, Melissa, for that question. Um, absolutely. And that we've been having lots of conversations um, because with different organizations around exactly what you're talking about. It's tricky to back to the time piece, right? Um, a lot of these things take five to 10 years to show outcomes in adults um, alone. But obviously, as you all heard here, and many of you without potentially being physicians can recognize, gosh, if we did this with youth, we could expect much longer, better outcomes for generations to come. Um, and so I would just emphasize it's a both and. We need to change things in the acute setting, and we need to change things in, in the elementary school and kindergartens. And, um, and I would just emphasize that this kind of stay in your lane isn't working for us and so the need to be a partner it doesn't mean that we're doing all of the work but working closely with youth is a critical piece of the solution going forward yeah it makes a ton of sense and thank you so much for that uh, we have a comment from uh, charles that just says thank you to uh, dr courtney jordan beckler so thank you so much um so let's go with an anonymous attendee asks uh, what clinical trial or are there is there a current clinical trial that is taking place that serves as a good model for inclusion and representation? That's a really good question. Um, so number one, I would say that I don't have a readily available one um, in terms of a large clinical trial in um, Minneapolis or the neighboring areas. I will emphasize that I think the work that we're doing with Chance York is a good example of how that might look. Um, that was a study that was co-created by the community. The community said, hey, we want more upstream opportunities to look at reducing blood pressure and also improving mental health while we're living in this giant mental health crisis for our entire world. Um, we'd love to look at something that is accessible to not just Minnesotans, but nationally, and we want it to be free and virtual and be able to enroll anywhere, not just at Abbott Northwestern. And that's exactly what that trial does. So I do think when we think about inclusion and belonging, um, that it gets to all of those different pieces of how we're enrolling patients, where we're enrolling them. Are we taking the, the barriers away? Um, after we did the first week of that trial, we had to make a modification because we were, the way that we had designed it didn't actually work for the people that we were intending to be in it. So I think ha um, doing those things in real time versus getting kind of stuck in the traditional randomized controlled trial is a real need. Absolutely. Well, uh, Dr. Jordan Beckler, thank you for joining us. I know we are at time, but do you think you have time for just a few more questions? Yeah. I, I know you're seeing patients today, so thank That's you so fine. much for your time. Yeah. Uh, so the next question in, in the Q&A pod is, uh, it sounds like you had hosted a community listening session fairly recently. Is there anything that you wanted to share with the audience in terms of interesting things that you may have heard from that session, or could you speak to that? 
Yeah, so I think that the the themes that we hear are very similar each time. I think um, the trust piece is huge and um, people have made it very clear that uh, acknowledging the past and just so that we're not pretending that it didn't exist is really critical and um, acknowledging what it looks like now going forward. When I was in um, Baton Rouge recently on a, um, a health equity symposium that we were doing with the Kappa, Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity, there was such a great conversation about trust in that regard of, yeah, it is 100% true. And then having one of the leaders from Kappa Alpha Psi say, and it's changing. And, you know, what have we learned from the COVID pandemic in terms of how uh, who delivers the message, where the message is delivered in terms of bridging those barriers of trust. So I think that I think that that's key. And then I would also say the other thing that we're hearing from the listening session is how do we better include some of these smaller nonprofits that have been doing this work for a long time? How do those organizations like Insight News um, and others uh, get paid for their time and efforts because asking people to continually volunteer and have the finances go to kind of the traditional players doesn't work uh, in terms of solving these disparities. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's fantastic. So you mentioned the historical mistrust, essentially. And this attendee who asked it uh, anonymously, uh, the question is, there is a historical mistrust in joining clinical trials from the Black community in particular. So is there any sort of messaging campaign from larger organizations that's going on to try to improve uh, that, that trust issue? Yeah, so I think the, the short answer is no. There's not a larger um, uh, uh, marketing campaign going on. I think what I would say is um, a lot of what we hear is there's a lot of mistrust in some of those larger organizations. And so that I think, once again, some of the solution is going to be getting into uh, the grassroots efforts and showing up and starting to change not just the narrative, but the actions that people are seeing when people, um, I feel like that is part of the response that that we've had when we go out into the community and continue to show up when when there's not necessarily, you know, just something that is a win for the Heart Institute, but when you're showing up to be at the, um, at the north side food distribution, when you're volunteering in these places, when you're supporting um, local businesses, um, black owned businesses, that that says a lot. Um, and and it versus, you know, some type of commercial effort, um, right? We know this from politics alone. These, these things are not solutions. Um, solutions are um, being a part of the community and being a, a, a trusted resource that way. So I think it's going to, um, take time, but I do think that it's changing. And I, I think once again, that the pandemic was a big part of that. Um, we saw a, a much larger increase in who was getting vaccines when, again, um, when we were forced to get out of the health system and be in the communities and, and, and work with lay leaders and others in terms of um, the messaging. Yeah, great, great points. Um, just one follow up to that. This question came through registration, but this attendee was wondering, uh, could you highlight some local resources or even just smaller organizations to what we were kind of just talking about that are doing uh, work in health equity and justice other than MHIF? Yeah, so um, the University of Minnesota is doing some great work. Uh, Rachel Hardiman is uh, a leader on maternal mortality um, locally and nationally, has recently received $5 million um, to start a center around health equity, um, specifically in maternal health outcomes. And so I think they're doing great work. Um, Blue Cross and Blue Shield uh, is, is doing great work. Um, United Healthcare has 
um, put resources into other organizations to help contribute locally. We're one of the original sponsors of some of the work that we were doing on the north side. Uh, the YMCA, I think, is doing really great work, has a so whole center around equity and training um, staff and um, different organizations around equity. Uh, Medtronic has been doing some, some work locally to help fund that. I would emphasize that there are, again, a ton of smaller organizations um, that are that are also doing good work. Tony Santa and what he's doing um, with soccer in St. Paul, another great um, great organization. Um, Minneapolis Public Schools um, having a lot of different uh, work that way. The Page um, Scholar Organization and what they've done from an educational perspective. So lots and lots of work. I think um, we just have to really um, help things escalate now to continue to these great outcomes. Yeah, that's that's fascinating and encouraging to see all sorts of these different organizations getting involved. Um, so I know we are past time. So I think a good way for us to wrap up here is just, uh, is there anything else that you would like to say to our audience while they have them online? Is there anything that you're particularly excited about? I guess I'm most excited um, to see the new approaches and to see sort of some um, brave attempts to try innovative ways to look differently. I'm excited um, to see technological solutions. I think artificial intelligence um, will be a big part of of getting information out to people faster. Um, so uh, it's ex an ex it's an exciting time. I think we still have a lot of work to do, but I thank all of you that registered for this and please reach out to us um, with further questions, ways that we might partner together or any other uh, questions or solutions you might have. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much to ev for everyone for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate your time and participation. A huge special thanks goes out to our wonderful panelists and, of course, our lead faculty member for the afternoon, Dr. Courtney Jordan-Beckler. Thank you so much for your time. I just wanted to mention that I did put a chat prompt in the chat pod, and uh, it, it has details on our next On the Pulse session, which is What's the Big Deal About Cholesterol, featuring Dr. Elizabeth Tui on Wednesday, December 7th. Uh, so please take a look at that and feel free to register. We would love to host you. Uh, Dr. Jordan Beckler, I know you have some patients to see, so we'll let you go. Uh, and thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, John. Bye, guys.